Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to welcome you to our Quadriga debate on the subject of Science 2.0, Science in Transition. I'm delighted to see so many people, even if they're still up in the back rows, but I'm convinced that they will soon join us and the debate. And I would also like to thank our partner Elsevier um, for supporting uh, this debate and for contributing to this debate, um, especially Mr. Hannifried von Hindenburg and Angelika Lex, um, who supported us in the preparation of this uh, event. In order to give more people the chance of following ton tonight's debate, we also um, have established a live stream so there will be a live stream recording in the next two hours, and I would also like to welcome all the viewers of, these, of this live stream. This debate is part of a conference week, which is entitled The Digital Turn. And uh, for those who have not had the chance to uh, attend the other conferences in this week, uh, let me just uh, explain what this week is all about. Starting last Friday, the Stifterverband and various partners organized a number of events on the digital future of science and education. Among them, a, comp a conference on open educational resources, a conference on MOOCs, and today's ELI conference, who addresses certain challenges in society and the educational system which have to do with the digital transformation. We also always tried in these formats to bring together people from the university system, people from the science system, join them with people from industry and politics, uh, because we, we are convinced that these challenges we are facing cannot um, be uh, addressed by a single sector in society, but we have to sort of uh, overcome this sectorial uh, 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 gap. Um, Today we also have um, panelists from industry, scientists, science and politics, and I'm looking forward to, to their insights into tonight's topic. Science um, 2.0, what do we understand when we use this term? And I must admit it's a quite uh, generic term, and you can virtually use every kind of change which is going on in science and education right now. Um, the debate should focus on the question of how digitization transforms the way scientists conduct research. We will be hearing about new information technologies and how they offer new um, opportunities for research and the publication process. New opportunities for science communication, for research collaboration. And I should also add, new opportunities for business models um, of companies who are involved in this process of communicating science, uh, of, of networking, uh, do net, uh, networking in the science system, and, um, uh, and so forth. Um, it is, in fact, a large agenda that, that is associated with this term. So we need, I, I think, we need to focus uh, uh, the debate, and in order to do that, we need a good moderator. And we have Jan Martin Viada, who will be moderating this debate, and I'm sure he will be able, I know him from many uh, discussions, he will be able to focus this discussion on what is really important. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome Jan Martin Viada. I'm delighted to welcome the panelist, Dr. Stefan Bergman, um, Professor. Gregory Ralph Crane, Dr. Stefan Kaufmann, and Pro uh, Professor Klaus Tochtermann, who will be introduced by Mr. Viada uh, in detail. Thank you for participating in the debate. And uh, let me add that after the discussion here, there will be, um, there will be uh, some wine and a light buffet upstairs, so uh, you can you can join the debate and you can uh, follow up on the debate upstairs in a more relaxed atmosphere. 
That is all I have to say. I'm looking forward to the discussion. And Martin Viada, this floor is yours now. Thank you very much, Volker Meyer Gucke. Everybody is, has found his seat. Ladies and gentlemen, Science 2.0, Science in Transition. The title of this Quadriga debate sounds like just another buzzword. In a never ending series of all too serious talks on how digitization is about to change the world as we know it. Some of these talks, I admit that, have left me puzzled in the past. Because once you put this buzzword aside, once you get past what we call Sonntagsreden in German, exactly at the same moment when you try to drill down, down to the core of it, of Science 2.0, suddenly you find maybe the change is not that fundamental at all. Maybe at its core, science stays what it always has been and will be. Well, we will find out about that, or at least we will try to. We will start by asking what exactly Science 2.0 means to our panelists here, and I will ask the panel to be very concrete on that. What are the promises? What may be its shortcomings? And this is only the beginning. Afterwards, we will try to describe what Science 2.0 really does to research and researchers, to universities, and to publishers. So let me introduce my fellow panelists to you. I will start on my left-hand side. I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Stefan Bergmanns. He is Vice President of Global Academic and Research Relations at Elsevier. He oversees EU strategic initiatives, partnerships, and stakeholder needs. Mr. Bergman holds a PhD in genetics and molecular biology and was postdoc at Harvard Medical School. In 2009, he became head of the Biomedical Sciences Unit of the European Science Foundation before, in 2013, he started in his current position at Elsevier. Welcome, Dr. Bergman. Also, a warm welcome to Dr. Stefan Kaufmann. He is lawyer by profession and since 2009, member of the German Bundestag representing the city of Stuttgart. In 2014, he became spokesperson of the CDU-CSU parliamentary group on the Committee on Education, Research and Technology Assessment. Additionally, he is, among many other things, member of the CDU Federal Committee on Education, Research and Innovation. He completed his doctorate in law at the University of Tübingen and a warm welcome to you. Dr. Kaufmann. <laughs> Professor Gregory uh, Crane is the only native speaker here on the floor, and we already talked, told him that in case we don't know some English word, we will ask him and he can translate for us. Um, so you know your role now. He is currently the Alexander von Humboldt Professor of Digital Humanities at the University of Leipzig. In his work, he combines classical philology and computer science, applying computer science methods to systematize human cultural development. The best example of what he actually is doing is the Persus, as you say in English and German, Persos Digital Library, a comprehensive and freely accessible online library for antique source material, which you developed. He completed his doctorate at Harvard and also worked there as an assistant professor since 1998. He has been professor at Tufts University before coming to Leipzig in 2013. Welcome, Professor Crane. <laughs> and last but not least, I'd like to welcome Klaus Tochtermann. He is the director of the German National Library of Economics at the Leibniz Information Center for Economics. He also is professor of media informatics at the University of Kiel. He's an expert in information technology-based knowledge management, web-based tools, and services for digital libraries. In 2012, Mr. Tochtermann initiated the Leibniz Research Alliance Science 2.0. He holds a doctorate in computer science from the University of Dortmund before joining Leibniz in 2010. He worked as scientific director of the research institute No Center in Austria. Welcome to you as well. So, Mr. Tochtermann, let me start with you. Before we just started out, we talked about cars. And um, I, talked, uh, I, I talked to you about 
a car that is driven by gas, and the new thing is a car driven by um, power, like electric power. So would you say that this is a revolution? And if you, comp uh, if you compare that to science, is actually that what we are talking about, like a car that is just, just have a new kind of fuel, a new kind of power, or are we talking about changing from cars to maybe flying airplanes or something? So I wonder, what are we talking about? About a major shift or more of a minor shift when we talk about science 2.0, car or airplane? Well, uh, is it working? Okay. Um, well, I, I think it's a natural development of how science uh, will uh, um, happen, and it's a f an, a, an uh, like event which is taking place bottom up. So the researchers, the scientists, are using and applying new technologies, and um, with these new technologies, they can have new publication processes and new research processes. And let me give you an example: instead of the traditional publication in a printed journal. We have now alternative publication forms, like, for example, scientific wikis or scientific blogs. That is number one. So that is an add-on to what already exists. And second add-on is, um, like the past centuries, uh, information access, access to scientific information could only take place through the libraries. And now it's more decentralized. We have many channels on the World Wide Web, uh, like, for example, environments like Mendeley, environments like ResearchGate, where the scientists can pu put their publications, and then the researchers, the others, can access these publications without any need and help of a library or a publisher. So that is the second add-on as compared to Science 1.0. So I think it's not really a revolution, it's a natural further development of how scientific processes um, will happen. Mm -hmm. So no revolution, more of an add-on, some kind of evolution maybe, something like that. Professor Cray, would you agree with that? We are always talking about revolutions here, but maybe it's not a revolution? Well, I think enough, there's quantitative change, but with enough quantitative change you get qualitative effects. Uh, I think I would agree at the core level of Wissenschaft, there probably is continuity, uh, and I argue in my own field that these new methods allow us better to realize our most ancient goals uh, than we were able to do in print culture. That said, uh, in terms of the culture of intellectual life, we are facing a revolution. We are facing something, that, and you can tell that by the stiff resistance. Uh, that change provokes among many of my established colleagues. Uh, the simplest thing is a blog. You know, do you, does it count to publish in a blog? I think it's a ridiculous question. Your ideas are what should matter. Uh, but I think there are three, just, uh, say there are three things about publication that need to change. First, there was the license. In the old days, we had closed publications because books could only travel, were expensive. They'd only get to a few libraries. So it didn't make any difference if they were expensive. Second, even if you made your books available, your publications and articles available as a PDF, uh, they're not, they do not have encoded in them the knowledge to support many of the, of the composite intellectual tasks that we would like to perform. Uh, and they're not properly structured even for the tasks for which they're superficially done because they're designed for human beings to read, not for machines. Mm -hmm. Third, they're not, the research we do does not realize the goals and possibilities of a digital medium. It still has internalized the constraints uh, of print culture. And that, so we're basically in this sort of incunabular phase where we're imitating manuscripts and putting out Latin Bibles, not thinking about Martin Luther mm -hmm. uh, and what happens when information can flow in fundamentally new areas. So what you say is that Basically, Science 2.0 is a revolution of publication. I'd it's, say it's, it's about a publishing. Revolution of access to knowledge and of authority. And of intellectual authority, that is the challenge. And if you want to see one aspect of Science 2.0 in its pathological phase, it's ISIS, which uses information technology to disseminate ideas and to influence the world mm -hmm. uh, using ancient text. Let's maybe talk about another example, not ISID, but Perseus Library, which is a little bit more civil example, maybe. So maybe you tell us what, in what ways that changes the world as we know it. So I think that the, 
When I began as a scholar, uh, a professional scholar at Harvard University, I realized what really allowed me to become a professional was that I lived in Widener Library, the greatest university library in the world, and I could look at all the data. I could put my eyeballs on all the secondary and primary sources, or many more than you could do anywhere else, and that this allowed me to think at a level that was not feasible without that data. And it was this idea uh, 30 years ago when we began that a constraining fact or element of intellectual life is the ability to put your eyes or your ears or whatever your senses upon the sources of any given statement. And one of the core ideas of Perseus is to realize Auguste Burke's vision of philology in right down the street from here 200 years ago to try and integrate all information about a, a period in a way that simply was inconceivable when I got my PhD in the 1980s. So basically that is the change that you're describing, why you d this develop versus library to make a difference right there. Dr. Kaufman, I sometimes wonder when you hear researchers tell about what they're doing, what they're changing, and you as a politician and as not an expert maybe in natural science. Do you get that? Do you understand what's happening there? I admit I sometimes don't. So can you actually grasp what's going on out there? Uh, yes, good evening at first. Um, yes, it's uh, in some topics very difficult to follow this scientific debate, but uh, as a politician we are awaiting results and in this sense, as you asked before, for me it's a very big evolution, this uh, Science 2.0, as a very big opportunity, sharing um, knowledge worldwide for uh, solutions, to find solutions for global challenges, also as an um, opportunity for emerging countries to participate in scientific debates, debates. So I think from a political point of view, it's a very interesting uh, development and it's a big uh, opportunity for society at all. And later on we should talk about the ways how, politi uh, how politicians can support that development and sometimes also how they can, or how they actually are preventing that development from happening. But that's something we will talk about later on. Dr. Bergmann, also to you the question. Evolution, revolution, what do you think? I would actually fully agree with uh, Dr. Tochterman in the sense that I do see this, uh, I take the, the R away, it is an evolution. Um, but, but I would agree with you also, Professor Crane, in the sense we're seeing a mass, master revolution happening in the sense that it is a culture change. It's massive culture change that's taking place in the research community. Um, openness, more openness, more transparency, more sharing taking place. And so going back now to the role maybe of a publisher, since you know this is who I work for, uh, you were using the example of Mendeley. I think Mendeley is a good example because we have experts, we have data, we have technology. We put that together for innovation that they are going to help the research community with this evolution slash revolution. Uh, it will bring more efficiency, more collaboration, and indeed Mendeley offers a social media platform for scientists. And now we're adding new features such as a data repository so people can share their data, but at the same time also tools like an electronic lab notebook that when I did my postdoc or my PhD, I wish I could have. I put everything on paper and still today 50% of the researchers are using paper. Whereas we need, as Professor Crane said, we need to be able to bring that to the digital world. So that's what we're doing, helping researchers in that transition, actually. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the different roles here. What does Science 2.0 do to the role of researchers, to the function of higher educational institutions, universities, research institutions, and what does it do to the role of publishers? Maybe, Mr. Tochtermann, let's start with the researchers. How does it change the world of researchers? You already described a little bit about it, but how does it affect how you, how you become a successful researcher, how you become uh, world worldwide known as a researcher? Maybe you talk about that a little bit. So thanks to Science 2.0, the researchers can organize themselves much easier as compared to Science 1.0. And I would like to give you an example. In 2011, we had the EHEC virus in Hamburg, you know, remember maybe. And um, 
so how was the research and publication process to identify the, uh, this virus? It was uh, first the data sequence of the genome was published openly, so all the research data was accessible open. Second, the community started a discussion and a debate in an open blog. So everybody could participate in this open discussion. And thirdly, a publication appeared open access. And that is a very new um, kind of research process as compared to Science 2.0, to Science 1.0. In Science 1.0, those who have, had identified the genome sequence would have kept it, you know, closed. They would have uh, thought about it and then probably uh, um, with a small group of researchers would have published in a licensed journal or a conference proceedings. So here more participation, more scientific discourse and more collaboration is possible thanks to Science 2.0. So basically you just described the basic idea of open access there, that you, that you try to open up one thing, data. So when you, when you have a research project, you open up the data to all of other researchers out there. The second thing is that you make the findings that you have available without costs. Yeah, well, um, Science 2.0 and open access is not necessarily the same. So you can work in a Science 2.0 environment with uh, blogs and wikis and uh, collaborative tools, but the final publication is still a uh, licensed journal paper. And the other way around, it's the same. You can produce an open access paper without using any Science 2.0 tools. So they have some overlaps, but not the same. So the overlap is the digital technology, but that's about it. Can I just give sure. an example in the case of data? Because that's exactly what I did for my postdoc. So when I was a postdoc uh, in Boston, uh, I developed methods to be able to sequence uh, and to map genetically zebrafish, which was a, a, an emerging model to study cancer. At the time, all the methods I was developing to be able to be recognized, so rewarded for my work, I needed to be in papers from others as an author. So I was really subject to their, them being kind with me, and, you know, common practice. Today, we, we have, for example, what we call micro-articles. They are open access journals that we've created that allows you to publish specifically your data, describing what it is. So I would have my own publication, and others then would be able to, to, to use it. So that's, you know, micro-articles. We have that for, for data. We have that for methods, for codes. So that's a change you're seeing. But I, I agree, people need to, to, you know, researcher need to be ready to do that because in my field, biomedical research, they still cling on to their data. Mm -hmm. And we stick with you for a second. Um, right now, the evaluation of research, research, of good research, is mostly done by peer review. So basically, a very analog idea, you could say. I heard that um, Elsevier is also trying to develop, new f to develop new forms of some kind of more digital peer review. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, there are several pilots going on because, uh, well, and we're not the only one testing that. It's really piloting. Uh, again, the world is changing, world of research is changing, and people are ready to try other things. One thing we're, we're, we're testing, we're using the Mendeley platform. Uh, we did that with cell journals, um, and the idea was to take, offer to the reviewers a platform where they could interact with each other as they were doing the reviewing. So they could see each other's comment, and that would enrich the discussion. And the next stage will be, now they bring in the author. And so you have now a dialogue between the reviewers and the authors. And of course, the editor could be part of that. So that's one way of testing it. Another great experiment, I think, is called the um, uh, register reports, where now what you do is you don't review the results. But before even starting your experiment, you submit the ideas you have and what you want to do. That's what's being reviewed. And whatever the results come out, it will be published, which means that even negative results, for example, or results that are not hot, will come out mm -hmm. also as a publication. So those are types of evolution mm -hmm. you're seeing in peer review. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Crane, when we talk about those changes to peer review, to uh, evaluate forms of evaluation, do 
most of your colleagues actually want that. You talked about resistance, about skepticism among professors, among, among researchers. Do you think that they are open to these types of new development? Or is, for example, the peer review procedure as we have right now so much introduced that people don't want that to change at all? Well, I don't think it's, I would not just speak in terms of peer review, I would think speak in terms of the comfort of doing the same thing your, your mentors did, who did the same thing their mentors did, who did the same thing the people before them did for several centuries. Uh, and the tremendous resistance to, any, to change, uh, it's really a, a question of, of authority and who your audience is. And what I see as the big shift was when we were dealing with analog media, and we could only reach research libraries, we only had to write for other professors. Uh, and we made, I believe, a, a virtue of a bad necessity. We are now able to think in terms, or to, uh, to think in terms of advancing the intellectual life of society, which is my job as a humanist. I don't know a better way of describing it. Uh, and that is the highest goal. Then you drop down and say, what's the mechanism to serve that? Is peer review to the way to address that? Uh, peer review is, and so there, there's a saying attributed to a former German politician, I don't believe he actually said this, that laws and um, uh, sausage are two things you do not want to see the process of making. You just want to consume them. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I think my experience in 30 years that peer review is the sausage, uh, sausage making of academia. So I have no real illusions, uh, and I've seen it gamed too many times. But can you live without sausage? Uh, well, I, you realize I'm American, so I, I guess I, I, I can, though I choose not to. Uh, we do need review, but whether, you know, I've seen the abuse of anonymous review far more often than its proper usage. Uh, and scientific discourse is discursive, it's iterative, uh, it goes back and forth, and I've seen the worst abuses when I'm trying, when I'm seeing innovative research be submitted, the blind reviews from people who do not know the difference between open data and open access, for example, mm -hmm. uh, who cannot be answered. Mm -hmm. with, so it really, I, don't, I, I got real problems with peer review as it stands, no problem with a, some kind of evaluative process. So there might be an opportunity there to change that now through uh, Science 2.0. I mean, I, I just in my own practice, and I'm old enough so I don't really care anymore much what people think, uh, but I will publish something to my colleagues, they will respond, and now I will publish it on my blog, uh, and people will say, well, why don't you really publish it? Well, I say, I publish it, then people will, will respond. Then I, will, I may well make, you know, make changes, uh, and this, is, this back and forth strikes me as being a very effective way of developing ideas. Uh, it'd be nice to have a, a copy editor at some point, uh, but we don't get copy editors in peer review anyway, most times anyway. <laughs> so we see there is some substantial change when it comes to the, or there could be some substantial change when it comes to the role of the researcher, them, the researchers themselves. So I wonder how about the institutions? What does Science 2.0 do to research institutes like yours, Professor Tochtermann? Will there be change because of that? Will there be any change at all or just science as usual? Um, so there are two aspects to mention. Um, the first one is a library. We have now much more channels through which we can disseminate our literature. Just to give you two examples, uh, or one example, when I joined that institute in 2010, we had 800,000 downloads of digital documents, open access and licensed digital documents, full text. In 2014, we had 5.4 million downloads of digital documents, licensed and open access only because we are using these Science 2.0 channels. That is, we have a much better reach out. That is number one, so from the perspective of a uh, information service provider. From the perspective of a like, research institute, um, Science 2.0 causes lots of troubles. Um, because um, like our young researchers, they bring in uh, their Science 2.0 tools. Just to give you one example, Dropbox. Dropbox is very popular to share documents on the web. 
But what they forget or what they often do not know is that um, you infringe European and German data protection law as soon as you have any personal information in your documents. For example, if you share your project proposals um, uh, in Dropbox and you have personal CVs of the researchers in these proposals, you um, violate German European um, data protection law. Why is that? Because the Dropbox servers are in the US and you transfer personal data from Europe and Germany to the US. And nobody knows that. And what we do not have is like a secure environment for our researchers um, in which they can use mm -hmm. such tools without taking care too much about these violations. I'm a little surprised that you mostly talk about the challenges here because I thought that you would say something like, well, that's as you start out to say, well, that's a great way, a new kind of outreach to the public, to, to the people out there that uh, haven't been interested in research so far. At least, Dr. Kaufmann, the, the, the politics, the, the, uh, the government tries to push that through digitization to say, well, uh, science and researchers have to open up and use the digi digital channels for that. Yes, uh, we started yesterday with the IT platform, Minister in Wanka, um, for uh, digitalization in uh, education and uh, science. Uh, but we are uh, on the beginning in the, in the question of science 2.0. We started more thinking about education, uh, digitalization in education, in schools. And now we started to think also about science 2.0, about the question how to... Um, uh, which, which qualifications do we need, uh, how to teach teachers, uh, which offers do we need for the, in the schools, and a very basic, mm -hmm. a very basic work to say, and uh, how to use big data. That's a very big topic mm -hmm. to, to, um, to push this uh, process of Science 2.0. Mm -hmm. The legal framework for mm -hmm. open access, these are the questions yeah. uh, which are addressed now to the politics. Yeah, but let me hit, just throw in another password, um, citizen science. That's something that you actually, from my point of view, can't imagine without Science 2.0. Can you, Professor Crane? I should say that citizen science is, is a topic that, or a theme that not only confuses but makes it in, infuriated many of my colleagues. They see, they see it as diminishing the role of expertise. I don't see it that way. And one of my two academic assistants is, in fact, specifically hired to work on citizen science in philology uh, and to show the applications of citizen science with the most abstruse uh, and superficially challenging tasks of philological analysis and research. Dr. Bergman. Yes, I just wanted to comment on that because I was this, uh, I had lunch actually with people from the European, um, U European uh, Association on Citizen Science. They're based here at the Natural History Museum. Uh, and it's quite interesting because when you see the consultation that the European Commission led on Science 2.0, citizen science is very low on the agenda. And I go back to what you're saying, Professor Crane, it's because it was mainly answered by researchers who are quite worried about it. But I think that, yes, digitization is clearly making <laughs> tools available for, you know, for, for citizen science. One example I'll give you is uh, we have STM Digest, which now allows to train early career researchers. We have a platform for that. It's all digital. Once they're trained, they're put in contact with authors of a paper, and the authors of those papers have had an impact. The, the paper has an impact that is societal, that's on policy. And those early career researchers, in coordination with the author, will write a lay summary. That lay summary is available then for citizens. That means the citizens have access actually to knowledge to which they didn't have access before. So that's something that is feasible today only because we've got the tools to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, when you spent the day at the, or, or lunch at the Museum for Natural Science, you just met the, one of the main supporters of citizen science in Germany, Professor Vogel, Johannes Vogel, who probably told you all about his collections and how he's digitizing them. And so I think there, that's somebody who actually sees the opportunity, yeah. but obviously not all of researchers do yeah. that or institutions and, do that. And another good example is the fact that this is so powerful for scientists, and they haven't understood that yet. Imagine that if you had the population behind you as a scientist, you can influence these guys right here. 
the politicians. And that's something I think that, uh, that, that the, uh, the scientists are yet to understood, but trust me, some have understood it uh, already. It's quite impressive. <laughs> so after talking about the researchers and the institutions, there's one group left, the publishers, Dr. Bergmanns. I could even uh, come up with a theory that in digital uh, science or science 2.0, you don't need publishers anymore. So why do we need them? Don't you so wish. That we, that, don't why you do we wish. need you? <laughs> um, yes. That is, uh, we don't need you anymore? That is a, no, no, that is a comment that I've heard before, and uh, I would strongly disagree. That said, I do believe that the role of, of the publisher, as much as the whole research world, is evolving. Keep in mind, and that's, you know, I'm personally convinced with the fact that we publishers are a reflection of the world of research. And so we are, if you want, offering the services that the world of research is needing. And so in this case, what you're seeing is a transformation. We're offering the services that they will use, you know, they will need in the future. We, we haven't spoken much about open data right now, but that's clearly a topic on which we're, you know, after open access, that's the second biggest one. And it's mind boggling because people are wondering how they're going to achieve that. We've dealt with data for, for, for ages. Not many people know, but Elsevier is the fourth biggest, you know, commercial digital in information company in the world. Mm -hmm. And so we have solution. We're trying an open data pilot right now. So that means that when an article is under subscription and you're not able to access it if you don't have the subscription, you don't have access to the data behind. Well, we're making that data available to everyone for free because we don't want to own the data and we want to make that act accessible. And what we're seeing is that it increases the use of the data. And so we're probably going to expand that to more of our journals or all of our journals. So that's one pilot we're doing. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kaufmann. I, I just want to add, uh, I think it's one of the um, most important tasks also for, for politics to find uh, instruments to, to measure, to metering the result, the um, um, scientific uh, output. Um, without um, the publishers. So if, if we don't have the help of the, um, of the publishers anymore. Um, so to find uh, solutions, and I think we have to spend money as politics uh, for research in this, uh, in this field. So, so you want to spend metering. money so we don't need publishers anymore? No, not uh, Mr. Bergman's talk about uh, the role of the publishers in the future, yeah. but uh, to find um, some, uh, some instruments for, measure, for yeah. measurement okay. of uh, quality of okay. uh, scientific output. So let's ask the researchers here about the role of publishers. Uh, Professor Crane, you talked about the authority of publishing before, that the authority of publishing shifts over to the researcher himself, if I understood that right. So how do we need publishers there? So did the authority of publishing ever not lie with the researchers? I mean, it talk shouldn't to, Talk to Mr. Bergman about that. Yes. So I think that we need a marketplace. We need services that cost money. Uh, and so and that we need business models that support that. That said, let me explain to you what I, when people ask me what I like best about being a professor in Germany as opposed to the United States. Uh, in Germany, we don't have tuition. In Germany, I am a public servant, pure and simple. And one of the things I like about that is I, everything I do is paid for by the state, and it must be, as far as I'm concerned, for the benefit of the, of the general population. I don't see how I can justify, and I don't, giving ownership or a license of anything I produce to a commercial firm that restricts access to that. Actually, the University of Leipzig has terminated its cooperation with Elsevier. With Leipzig, or with, with Elsevier, but I'm speaking more generally. Uh, I simply can't, you know, other people see it differently. Uh, but I don't see it that way, and I will not publish anything or give anyone a license that does not publish anything except under a CC license, Creative Commons license, or equivalent. I will not review, or will review with great reluctance, any scholarship then I cannot download from an open server. But you are in a position that you can afford that. Maybe younger researchers can't. I disagree. I think in, in money institutions, if you talk to your, to your administration, say, I want to have an open data, open access publication track, they are not, your, your, your department may resist, but your dean and your president and your provost, at least where I come from, will be 
often enthusiastic and ready to serve you uh, and willing to work with you to give you the, 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 the memorandum of understanding to develop your work. Mm -hmm. Can I? Maybe first Professor Tottenham yeah. and then we're going back to you. Well, I, I, I don't see that uh, the publishers will play a crucial role in that business in the future. There is at least a second player, which is the library, um, because the new market is about new services. So it's not so much a, a market of where do I send my paper to, or who prints the book, who prints the you know, journal. Um, those will win who will offer the best services. And modern libraries, uh, modern information centers, they have the capacities to also develop these uh, services. And then they are a second player on that market. And at this point, it's open who will have the biggest market shares. Now it's up to you. Yeah, and, and going back to uh, some, some of what you were saying, I want just to be very clear that when we talk about new business models, and you know, further than that, open access. Uh, you know, Elsevier, like most of publishers today, offer all the options to authors. That includes open access, be it gold or green. Uh, it is a reflection, again, of the world today that the vast majority of papers that are published are still published under the subscription model. But we are seeing, indeed, that open access is growing to the point where last year it was around 15%, 13 to 15% of papers were uh, under the open access model. And you're model. okay with that? Absolutely. We, we support every option possible so, but, in open access. But, and that's why I want to clarify, sure. because we're not at all, again, we offer all the, uh, the, uh, the options. So if you want to publish with Elsevier, you can do it in open access. In gold, in green, we've got more than 220 our, uh, journals that are purely open access, and all of the other journals that we have oh. offer either the option of gold or green. Mm -hmm. So that's, and you end up choosing also your CC license, by the way, Professor Green. Okay. So, let, but still, I have one last question regarding that uh, issue. If that is the case, that the publishers are really op open to open access and open to change, why is it the case that, for example, all Dutch universities plan to boycott Elsevier in 2016? So, so far, it hasn't happened, I think. It hasn't Personally, happened so far, but they're talking about it. Of course. All Dutch they're universities. Negotiating, they're negotiating how they're going to have access to publications in the coming years. And as a tool in the negotiation, they're clearly putting pressure on, on, on the publisher. I think, you know, you can, you can question if it's fair or not, but it, it's, it's a negotiation tool, definitely. Uh, I am not part of the negotiation. And I don't think we should comment on an ongoing negotiation. But I think that some of the solutions that will come out of that negotiation, which I'm convinced will be settled, are going to be quite constructive and interesting. And I'm, I'm quite curious to see. Uh, I know there's a meeting taking place, I think, this week, potentially, or next week. Uh, there are offers on the table. So it's really not at the point where it's, it, it's, uh, it's not, you know, the partners are not talking to each, each other. To the contrary, and again, keep an eye on it. I think it's going to be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So I think that we just, you, you want to add to that? or? Uh, yeah, I, first of all, I, I have to point out, my sister-in-law is an Elsevier editor. So when I go after Elsevier, it's not personal. Uh, <laughs> we, do manage, we do manage to have Thanksgiving, and, and Elsevier pays for my nep part of my nephew's you know, upbringing. So I, it's a complicated world. Uh, but I, I think it's important for people to understand, I think, how we, we, at least my colleagues and I, work. And I work in a community of scholars who are completely digital, who are, work in a completely open space. Open access is not the driving force. With open access, you're competing with the same services to do your same damn PDFs and make them open. I mean, it's really... It, it, it's sort of a moral argument, uh, access argument. The big driver is open data. Because I cannot do my research unless I can aggregate sources, you know, data from an open-ended set of sources, collect them, operate upon them, modify that data, and produce a new composite thing that I then redistribute with all the provenance data embedded in it uh, as a new publication without having to sign any agreements 
because it, you know, it all has to be done automatically in a machine action, the, the licenses have to be machine actionable for this to scale. Uh, once you get to that point, you, you, it blows up, you forget about open access. Uh, the world is completely different with a completely different set of physics. And that was, that's what drives science, and I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what we're seeing right now is a shift completely of the focus on the scientists. Because when it comes to open data, I know when I did my research, there was no way I was going to share my data because that was my bread and butter. That's how I was going to publish. I think that that's what we need to be able to do is help change the culture with the right incentives and also having the tools that will allow to share the data. So again, you know, we're talking about a repository. We're developing a tool that allows to search data that are available in FigShare, in Science Direct, in uh, other databases uh, for data. So we're developing those tools to actually be able to search that. And also, we're, we're, we're trying to work with the researchers to develop those solutions that will allow them to store, share, discover, and more importantly, indeed, use and reuse. So Dutch universities are going to love you soon, basically. I sure hope so. They haven't spoken to me yet. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Dottermann. Um, well, um, open data sounds great. You know, the concept is, you know, we make open all our data so we can merge it with one another, build new open data pools. But let us look deeper into the details. And this, what I'm telling now, is just a reflection of, we, of our discussions we have at the European level and also within the Leibniz Research Alliance. There is a conceptual difference between a publication and data. With a publication, I already made the decision that I will publish my research results. And then I just decide whether I publish it open access or in whatever licensed journal. When I have gathered my research data, I haven't not yet made the decision whether to publish the data or not. It's just the data. And in different disciplines, you have huge you know, restrictions on the data. You have privacy issues on the data. You have uh, competitive issues on the data. You have data protection issues on the data. So it's far more complex as compared to the publication. And we cannot just say open data as such is a great concept. We have to look into the disciplines and we have to always keep in mind the basic decision whether to publish it or not has been made with the publication, but not with the data. You want to add to that? Yeah, I do want to actually you know, reinforce something that you just said, which is that it's important to realize that not all data can be open. Uh, even most of the data I get to work with, and in fact, I try to work with open data, can be shared, but there are some categories that will, cannot and never should be. For example, one of the most important categories of data for the survival of my field are the mistakes that learners of ancient Greek, Latin, and other historical languages make when they try to learn the language. Because we desperately need to understand how people understand these languages so we can get them into people's heads. But that, then you're talking about student data and mistakes that students make. And you have to be very careful uh, about what you do with that. It's like medical data. So you have to you know, think about what the protocols so, are by which you can exchange that. But who gets to decide what data is open and which is not? Well, I think that's at one level I can say it's a legal issue. Uh, when things are mature, there are laws. So you know, I don't have to worry about people. Sh if people share my medical data, they're breaking the law, whether it's in the United States or Germany. Yeah, but you can still, <clears throat> still change the laws of data protection. Well, I think, you know, Again, I tend to gravitate towards places where we don't have the issue of privacy, in part to avoid this kind of issue. So I'm, you know, there, somebody else would speak about, uh, you know, the area, the, the gray area where we don't know what the best privacy laws are. In the United States, we have no privacy laws, I guess, or government just like looks at everything anyway. So. There was a very nice paper by, by Barbara Prainsack recently about data. And they were, she was with her colleagues putting forward the fact that it needs to be community based. And so but that's what you're seeing a lot. We're talking a lot with our editors and the scientific communities to know, because indeed it will depend. In the medical field, my field, there are data you don't want to share at all. You cannot share legally. In some other areas, physics, at, I, I was speaking just Monday with the rector of University of Vienna, and she's a physicist, and she was just stunned because she was now discovering, talking to other scientific areas, 
uh, that actually that sharing of data is not automatic. And so she's learning that, that whole process. Leave it to the experts who are actually the community experts. Yeah, I was just introducing uh, the idea of data protection because I wanted to go on to the next question. The question of the legal framework and the political aspects of our discussion today. I want to ask the three non-politicians up here what they expect from the politicians when it comes to, uh, zero to uh, po science 2.0. The question is, do you really want the politics to do anything about science there, to, to get into all enthusiastic about this and to, to try to interfere with it? Or is the message, leave us alone there, let us just work? Professor Tochtermann. It's a very, very um, uh, difficult um, uh, part of the discussion because Science 2.0 is a bottom-up development. So it, it is happening anyway. It is driven by the researchers. And there is the risk that as soon as, the, as policy intervention starts, the researchers, you know, change direction and they use something different. That is a high risk. So the commission in the Science 2.0 consultation also asked about um, the fields of policy intervention. And the top three were open access, open research data, and then a better integration of the different research infrastructures. So um, there is a clear tendency towards where we need um, uh, policy intervention. And uh, for these three, we need, you know, I would say legal um, uh, frameworks uh, so that the researchers um, can be sure that what they do is taking place in a legal environment. So, for example, more Deutsche Länder, uh, Bundesländer should uh, come up with uh, open access strategies. Like I think Baden Württemberg already has one, Berlin already has one. So, there you need some kind of legal framework. Yes, um, I mean, um, I think Berlin is just in the discussion. Of course, Schleswig Holstein has one. So, um, we launched it uh, last year in November, and that is true. So, we need um, um, like uh, open access policies or strategies at the lender ebene. That is number one. We also would need like a position at least uh, from the federal level. So, what which is, is not there yet? Which we can is talk about why the federal level is so hesitant about that later on. And finally, all the funding organizations. I mean, um, um, German Research Foundation uh, DFG already has uh, requirements that um, you have to have um, uh, open access publications. Uh, based upon your, uh, all the scientific research which result from uh, a uh, project funded by the DFG must be published open access. And if you deal with the uh, research data, you must deliver a research data management plan so that they uh, see what are you planning to do with the data. The um, uh, Federal Ministry for Science and Education doesn't have a policy yet, but um, they are in the process of developing such a policy. Mm -hmm. And these are the policy interventions we, which are easy to implement mm -hmm. and which help a lot. Professor Crane, if we stick to expectations toward politics, we haven't mentioned the word money yet today. Does Science 2.0 cost money? Does, do we see uh, the need for the politi uh, political level to support the whole development with more money, more initiatives, some kind of programs or whatever? Something very German maybe, the question, I don't know. Well, certainly it requires investment, but that request, that investment, depends upon a social contract between the researchers and the government. Now, I, I should say something about the government and academic freedom. Uh, and I've read, you know, works by, uh, things by Wilhelm von Humboldt, insofar as I can follow his extensive German, uh, about the importance of akademische Freiheit uh, in dieser Stadt, uh, when you had, you know, the king, whichever king of Prussia it was at the time, uh, and the fear of being constrained by politics. And that fear lives today, whether it's always properly used or not is unclear. In academia, when you're like me, you're a professor, doctor, you have almost absolute freedom for about 20 or 25 years. Uh, but at the end of that time, when you retire, the, the question comes, will you be replaced? Will your field draw research support? Will you have students? Uh, so there is no such thing as pure research. There is always a political element in where you are trying to make a case, in, whether you're, you know it or not, you better know it, about why your field should be supported, whether it's your salary, which is locked in for 25 years, or your allocation of the DFG budget, 
or money from the Bay Am, Bay F, or whatever. So we always have to think about what contributions we make, whatever field we're in, to the society of which we're a part, when we go and, and imply that we should have more support or even continue getting the same amount of support. And a little bit more concrete on the question of Science 2.0, expectations towards the government, towards, towards politics? Well, let me give you a concrete problem uh, and a change in, in the idea of hermeneutics. So your conventional, in hermeneutics, nobody talks about, uses that word in English, unless they're theologians. Uh, you know, it's not a, a common term, but it's used here. And the general idea, of, I, as I understand it, as I experience, is that it, pro intellectual progress is measured by what an idealized, all-knowing researcher would learn new from some new publication. Uh, from my perspective, that's only one case. A case I have is the hermeneutics of many different brains trying to absorb the information or new idea, something new that was produced. And say I produce a new, I come up with a new text. Uh, who can understand that? What skills are required to understand and how far can you go? Very practical hermeneutic question, a very practical question with humanities. You have 800, you're probably going to have 800,000 new members of this country. And you should all very, be very proud uh, that you had this opportunity and what your country might have done. Uh, but the question is, are you going to hand them, these people, these new, your new fellow citizens, or fellow uh, inhabitants of this country, a uh, text of Goethe? What's that going to happen? Are you just going to look at them as alien people uh, from a really different place? How do you address this new inter internal uh, exchange that's taking place. That is a core humanities problem. And it touches upon language and culture as they understood in the brain, as they are represented in various ways. That's a core problem. And you face it right now, and that requires investment. But that's a science 2.0 two mm -hmm. problem. Right. Dr. Bergmann, then we go over to Dr. Kaufmann uh, to get the political perspective. Let me tie your two questions. The first one is about the legal framework. And the second one was about actually the money. So let's be very clear, open doesn't mean free, so it does cost money. That's, that's clear, so that's something we can put there. So the first thing I would say, any framework needs to be sustainable. It's true for open access, and we've seen that already, but it's gonna be the same for any of the open science that we're gonna see in the future. Open data is a good example. To get open data, you're gonna need to have investment to get to the point where you are able to share the data. The other aspect is that, yes indeed, the option now at the European Commission level on open science is to have a legal framework for some of those elements. But talking to Jean-Claude Bergelmann, he also says very clearly that since it is a bottom-up approach, he's very scared of having too much of a frame, a legal load actually on open science that would refrain its evolution. And I'm going to take your words from the ERA conference because I thought it was beautiful in the sense that you're talking about the bottom of our approach and now we're seeing a top-down approach from the European Commission or the government here. I think we need to find the middle path that you, that you were describing back in June, which is something in between top-down and bottom-up. We need to find a way and hopefully what the European Commission is putting in place right now with a stakeholder forum is going to be a solution because contrary to open access, in open science, open data, etc., the number of stakeholders is drastically increasing and they need to be able to have a say. So we have a good representation here, but that's also something I would say to the, uh, to the politicians. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kaufmann, so that's, it's a little bit complicated, the expectations towards the government, towards the politics. On the one hand, government is supposed to do nothing. Yeah? Keep your hands off. Let us work. On the other hand, you are supposed to uh, give legal frameworks, to hand out money for change. How would you describe the role? It's a little bit complicated for you. Yes, uh, to speak about open access, you described one of the, of the problems. So we have uh, responsibility of the federal, uh, federal states. Um, so we have uh, problems to find a solution on the federal level because, to be honest, there is a struggle between the Committee of Law and the Committee of Research um, about the question of open access. You talked about uh, open doesn't mean free. 
uh, and that's a big question. We have to uh, find a solution. We haven't found yet. What is the struggle there? I mean, that's something that probably is easily to agree upon, that open is not always free. Yes, but uh, how, how to six months uh, and then not to pay and to find a concrete solution, uh, that's, that's the point. Uh, and uh, because of that, we have some uh, solutions on federal level, like you talk, talk about Baden-Württemberg. And um, on the other hand, we should maybe look for a European, a European solution of this problem. And uh, what was clear now to me, we have to shift the discussion in the German politics more from problem of open access, which is uh, still a problem, to the problem of open data. And uh, I think we have to distinct between the openness of medical data, as you talked about, and what you talked about, uh, Mr. Tochtemann, um, this, um, this um, uh, example of, a of AHEC, of this uh, virus, to find a solution. I think both examples for open data, the one is maybe not um, problematic, the other one would be problematic. But I think we have really talked much more about the uh, problem of open data, also on a European level, than about the uh, problem of open, open access. access. There was another point in the discussion. Uh, you talked about new ways of evaluating science and research, new instruments that you are talking about, you want to develop, obviously, from uh, looking at the researchers, they don't see any need for that, for, politi for politics to uh, be in that field, actually. Yes, that's an interesting point of view. So <laughs> if there's no need, we, we won't pay anything uh, for it. But we have to find a solution. If we find a solution without money uh, of uh, the politics, if the researchers or um, Elsevier or ResearchGate or other companies will find solutions um, to measure some, the quality, so it's, it's fine. So then we don't spend money for it. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, we, we, we want to have um, uh, indicators which help us to measure like digitization of science. But who if decides on the indicators? Hmm? Who decides on those indicators? Yes, that is a political debate which uh, has to start soon. If you look into the indicators uh, in the Pact for Forschung and Innovationsbericht, so boring. You know, number of PhDs, number of ERC grants, number of I don't know what. And nothing, absolutely nothing referring to science 2.0. And uh, what's very important, and this is against something which can uh, be triggered by the politicians, is starting a discourse among all, you know, scientific organizations, HIACA, um, um, uh, the extra university research universities, and all the Stifterverband, of course, to, to at least initiate the debate. What could be possible indicators? Mr. Bergmans that's, and then Mr. That's, uh, that's the topic of the platform we started yesterday. Too late, maybe, but start. So I just wanted to make two comments on the research evaluation. I think in the context of open science, we need to think about open. It's open science, so you need to have open metrics. And when I say open, it's two ways. I agree with you that we have to move away from the current impact factor. I mean, it, you cannot, with publications only, evaluate the world of open science. You need to find new metrics. So that's, you know, metrics that are dedicated to open science. So that's the first uh, Are point. you serious about that? Because impact factors basically manifest the power of publishers. Yes, but at the same time, it doesn't reflect the power of the research world as a whole. I think impact factor but then, then will you're always be there. No, absolutely that. not. Because impact factor will be one of the many factors, indicators that need to be looked on, but they need to be there with other ones that are more relevant. I think when we talk about societal impact, and here we're really talking about societal impact in the sense that a parliament will evaluate that, you need to be able to go and look at other indicators. So that's why we're looking, for example, patents. And that's again the you know, chance of journals. science 2.0 that we're yes. able to find new and may indicators. I say just the second sure. point I wanted to make is that your metrics themselves need to be open in the sense that the methodology behind needs to be open so you can understand what it means. A danger today is when you look at something like a research gate score or alt metrics is that you don't know what's behind. So you need to be able to share with everyone how those are calculated so that they're open. So those are elements important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Professor Crane. So I think that um, I'm, maybe I'm lucky to be in the third world uh, of academia, which is the humanities, where we don't even have, if we have an impact factor in my field, I don't know what it is. Uh, we have, I'm supervising one tenure case 
I got 10 letters written by human beings coming in. We'll read the letters and see what they say. Uh, and I'm ranking candidates for another university, for another position, and I'm one of several. So there are other ways of doing it. But I think the, the important thing is to remember there are two complementary conversations. And they tend to, one tends to get overbalanced uh, over the other. Uh, the professors like to talk to each other. And they get very grumpy if they have to think about anybody but themselves. Uh, and this tends to be, and, this, and there's some advantages to that, but if it's just expert on expert discourse and there's no path to anybody in society, why, you know, then you don't answer the question, why am I being supported? Now, if you're, if you're working in medical research, like, like my wife, uh, who was a, a research biologist, it's easy to understand what, like she's getting supported. Uh, the question is how much support they should get. But I think we all need, when we think about evaluation, also to think about what the impact is. Why do we exist? Why do we have a job? Mm -hmm. But especially for humanities, that you haven't been so much influenced by impact factors so far. There might be researchers, there might be professors who are afraid of these new forms of evaluation, because if you are, for example, in ancient Greek uh, history or culture, you may not be so interested in opening up to all the people out there because you think there are not that many other experts than you are yourself. Well, if you, if you have, I think we had, we got 700,000 unique visitors to our digital library a month. They're out there. I know they're out there. Uh, and this is, and it's very encouraging. Uh, so, I, but I think if, if you look at impact figures, what is the impact of the humanities? I'll give you what a, a, a factor that I think demonstrates the power of the humanities in Germany. And that were the scenes of people in Munich recognizing in refugees something from their own past, whether they experienced or not, and coming there with water, with food, with clothing. You should all be proud of that as Germans. And humanists here should take pride because that reflected the education disseminated broadly into the society. Uh, and is a, wouldn't show up in a publishing impact factor. It showed <laughs> up the people coming in from Syria after a month of hair-raising, exhausting travel. Mm -hmm. All right, that's something that actually would be a good point to end the discussion, you know, but we're not there yet. Actually, I would like to open up the discussion over to you in the audience. I imagine that you also might have some questions, uh, maybe some comments on our debate. So we have about 15, 20 minutes, I think, around that time, um, and we can make use of that. So go ahead, ask your question, give us your comment, and meanwhile, we can all listen to the rain. So there are two questions. I think there, there was a mic somewhere. If it's not there, I will come over with my microphone and see that we manage that. I think there was one question. So you are first, and then there was another one over here. So maybe you give us your name and your question. I hold the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, my name's Jane Massey. Um, I, I'm a professional evaluator, and I have been for nearly 30 years, um, at, at both an evaluator of um, framework programs for the Commission, but actually most of my days now are spent out in development, aid programs and projects around the world carrying out evaluation. And it really was the last remarks um, and the reference back to the citizen scientist the most sophisticated evaluation today is taking place where it is participative. It is those who are impacted most that can help us understand most the value of what we're doing. So I just really wanted to add that comment. Thank you very much. So you're taking over? All right. So I'm going back and there was another question or another comment right there. Thank you. Um, I'm Iris Gishis, so I work for Elsevier. Um, I had a question for uh, Professor Crane. Are you currently actually developing or looking into how you would quantify or evaluate the humanities? And what are the big struggles that, or 
questions that come to your mind when you, when you do that. I didn't quite hear the question. Well, are you currently looking into how you evaluate? Because how you, 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 like you said earlier, you have to demonstrate you, f to the federal government and everything why you, uh, for your whole discipline. And then on the other hand, you're saying, you know, it's what we're seeing out there and what we're feeling that is the value. How, how do you shepherd, uh, shepherd your way in between those? Well, I think that um, one metric that I have, which is a really crude one, and I, I can't fully operationalize it, uh, but you know, if I ask myself, how successful am I in my narrowest field, which is as, a, as an advocate and researcher in ancient Greek? And so my question is, how many can, are more b human brains engaged with classical Greek because of what I did than otherwise? Now, I can sort of measure that because I can see how many people read Greek texts on our little website. That's one, one uh, way of looking at it. But that's, uh, and I would think, well, there's some kind of, it's not just looking at the text, but what kind of engagement is it? Understanding the impact of expertise is a really interesting research question for me and one that I would like to pursue. But for now, I'm just kind of a low level of it. Uh, how one measures the impact in society as a whole uh, is harder. The, 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 the normal surrogate is students. You get more students, you get more money. You get enough students, you're gonna be replaced. Uh, is that the best way to do it? No, uh, but it's a starting point. But this issue of how do you assess is a really interesting one, but the participatory side is, is a future. A lot of the work that we do is, may not be hypothesis driven, but there's a lot of classification work of high complexity. For example, analyzing historical language texts syntactically, morphologically, and semantically, which is a way of assessing actually expertise in the knowledge. Uh, that's something which has to be assessed. It's a different kind of assessment. It's an object of citizen science as well as expert knowledge. Mm -hmm. But maybe we stick to that point for a second because the first comment of, of uh, the lady who just yes. came first, she talked about the importance of participation uh, in the role of, well, deciding on research, uh, on deciding what research actually is important for society. Professor Tochtermann, is there a limit to that approach? Can society decide in every regard, what research is important and what not? When it comes to citizen science, um, one has clearly to differentiate between the different phases in which citizens get involved. If it's in the very early phase, in the phase of agenda setting, that is possible, of course, but then we should be aware that we uh, can maybe produce too high expectations on the side of the citizens. So they make a suggestion, um, to uh, research and investigate a certain topic, and then the scientists, you know, do the investigation, but the result might be not possible. From a scientific perspective, that's an okay result, but maybe the, sci the citizens had the expectations to, to get, a, you know, something which is possible. And here we have really to, to be very careful about, like, expectation management. And I think to, to achieve there a good balance, we also have to somehow um, better um, develop the citizens um, to understand scientific processes and, uh, you know, what, what our expectations are. If, it, it's, if citizen science takes place in later processes, uh, like, for example, when it comes to data collection, which is very much uh, the case in biodiversity, then it's okay. Mm -hmm. Because there's the citizens, like in, uh, in my part of Germany, in uh, Schleswig-Holstein, you know, they now count the birds flying from uh, Scandinavia to, to the south. And, but, yeah, but, but that's one thing. The other thing is to decide where the money goes to. That's another thing. To, to count birds is one thing. The other thing is to decide, okay, who gets the billions of euros for research on what topics? That's something that there shouldn't be a referendum on? Yeah, um, again, um, 
we, we, in Germany we have a citizen science project, GEWISS, which is exactly investigating how to best manage that. The problem is expectation management, and I think we experienced that in the political debate, in the Bürger Dialog, which was also kind of open process, and there the biggest problem was the mismatch between expectations of the citizens and uh, what the politicians could deliver. And we, in, in GEWISS, we, we simply want to avoid to make again this mistake on the scientific side. Mm -hmm. Professor Crane? Just quickly, uh, Professor Virgil, that you were One mentioning short. before, has a beautiful image of a pyramid on how citizens can get involved into science. And indeed, it can go from nothing to actually just be maybe a bit involved. For example, I have a colleague here who just a few weeks ago had a pint of science. And so he was helping with the pint of science, which is Café Scientifique. It goes to crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, and all the way to some few, but some scientists, actually doing research. So you've got the whole range. And I agree with you fully. You have to be very careful on the expectations there. But that's where, again, I will come back to that. I've said that many times at the EU level. It is an opportunity to engage with citizens, to have them on your side as a scientist, to be able to go back to politicians, you know, to the society overall, to decide what do we want to do with our science. Mm -hmm. Professor Crane. So I, I just want to point out, emphasize that society does decide in the long run what we do, what we don't do. Uh, there is a social contract. If you come from a field like mine that collapsed, uh, you're acutely conscious of this. Uh, if you were to go to Raqqa in Syria, you would not find much support for the Mint disciplines, uh, <laughs> as I read in the newspaper. So the societies set their own priorities quickly or, or over a long period of time. Uh, again, but I think the distinction with citizen science that we make is citizen science versus crowdsourcing. Uh, and for us, crowdsourcing is when you try and get people, as we say in, in American literature, to paint your fence for you. Mm. Uh, so you try and get people to do work that you didn't want to do, mm. and however you get them to do it is good. For us, citizen science is about people working and developing their own skills cumulatively over time. Mm. Uh, and that th you will find people, now there may be there are areas w which require such mathematical skills that you have to have your brain, I think, wired a certain way. Probably there are people who are not professors who have those brains. Uh, and so, but some fields may lend themselves better to this than others, but I think in the scope of the universe, of the world, of the human population, I, we will be surprised at how many people are able to participate in an interesting way uh, in setting our agenda. Mm. I completely agree with you, except for one point. I don't think that the majority of Syrian people actually agrees with what's happening uh, there right now. So it's not, it's not the will of the people that is happening there that is against research and science there, I would, I would say. Um, maybe to you also the question, Mr. Kaufmann. Wouldn't it be easier for politics just to give some alternatives and then ask the public to decide, should we do research on nuclear energy or on ancient Greek society? Um, no, I don't think that's the right way. I think we have to, politics have also to, uh, to discuss with the, uh, with the um, citizens, but have them to decide. So it's one point of uh, citizen science, what Professor Tochtermann said, uh, the form of a burger dialogue to ask uh, and involve um, citizens in some uh, difficult questions, like Stuttgart 21, for example, to, um, to produce uh, acceptance, to produce uh, transparency. That's a very important point. Um, and I think we should do that much more than before. But I think at the end, uh, politics uh, and the parliament have to decide how to spend the money. Are there more questions, more comments? There are, actually. So one, two, three, I would say, and then we go back to, to the panel. OK, uh, good evening. Um, I'm Sönke Bartling. I'm a, a, a scientist in the field of uh, uh, medical imaging research. And I want to start with a uh, comment or a citation from uh, Richard Rhodes. It, it's read, good science, original work, always went beyond the body of received opinion, always represented dissent from orthodoxy. However, then, could the orthodox, orthodox fairly assess it? 
So this is something that in science you can never foresee when there will be a, a new breakthrough. And this, and this brings me to the point that uh, you said that like, let's say you have like some um, new measurements of like impact factor or like RG score or social impact or, and which are not published. So if I compare it to Google and Google has like the best kept secret within Google is the way how they calculate the page rank and it's like secret because uh, then it cannot easily be manipulated. So that's, a, that's an argument for like keeping um, these new impact factor measurement system secret. So don't be too transparent. You want to answer through that right away? Well, just one comment. I think that uh, I've had discussion at the European Research Council where you know they're doing breakthrough science, or at least they'd like to think so. I think they're doing it. But what they'd like to be able to do is assess how much of a breakthrough they're doing. And you're touching a point that is very important. How can they have panels that will identify the next breakthrough. And what you're touching upon is the fact that, yes, one indicator will never serve the purpose. That's why you need, as I said before, to multiply, to have a basket of indicators, but also, more importantly, have the human factor come in. You cannot do your full analysis just based on the indicators. In the end, the data you have needs to be looked at by maybe citizens maybe politicians, certainly also, I think, because I'm a scientist, scientist. But that's where the human factor comes in, because much more is, is involved in there. All right. Next question. The, the no, the gentleman in the back first. And then we go to you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Lennart Mack, I'm a researcher at the Open Data Institute and therefore I very much appreciate the fact how very often open data was actually mentioned this evening. Um, one question that is somewhat similar to the question your gentleman asked me before me um, is to me, we've spoken a lot about impact factors and um, how the logics of science and how science works actually change through open access and potentially open data as well. Now, the broader, somewhat um, maybe bold, hypothetical question that I'd like to ask ideally each of you um, is, do you actually expect more breakthroughs, more rapid creation of um, insights because of open access and potentially open data? The question goes to all of the panelists. So I think you want to start? It was, it was uh, the question, it's a little bit hard to hear in the front here. It was about the, the, uh, if it supports big science, right? How much openness do, can improve the uh, whole process? Yeah, do you expect more breakthroughs? I mean, breakthroughs could be more rapid. Okay. You could fill niches in, re in research. Do you expect more breakthroughs? In research, very broadly. So because of, of let, science 2.0, basically. Let's yeah. clearly say that that's what the European Commission is hoping for. They're hoping that through more openness, you're going to have, through open science, more innovation. That's clearly the case. I think it's too early to be able to know that. There are some elements of research, the research world, that will never change. Mm -hmm. It will always take a certain amount of time. I don't think that you can really speed up the process. What you can do is bring new features, as it was described before, that will actually make the process more efficient. And in that sense, I do agree that, yes, indeed, bringing solution to make it more efficient will improve the process. And so I think the question is open. And if I were to talk to politicians or to funders, I've already said to people at the commission, in the next wave of H2020 projects, there should be research projects looking at open science. And that's certainly one question that should be open. Yeah. But actually, once we understood your question, it's a great question because basically whatever we do here, we talk about science 2.0, it only makes sense if there is an effect. And so if there is no effect, then there is no good to it. So the question is, is there a positive effect to it? Maybe we just go just... That's, that's one next. remark. I think uh, um, despite of this uh, discussion about science uh, 2.0, uh, scientific breakthroughs, uh, it will 
it, it, it depends on the scientific, on the person, uh, on the individual. I think that was like that in the past and it will be like that in the future. Uh, that we need uh, p uh, strong scientific uh, professors, and I think that won't change. But the question is, is the road to innovation narrower or wider than it was before? That might be a good picture, Professor Crane. So let me give an anecdote from my afternoon when I visited my colleagues at the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences to talk about a rep what I would consider to be a revolutionary step uh, in changing the way in which we conceptualize the history of human, uh, human history, its study history of ideas, history of culture, which is happening as we start to exploit billions of words produced over thousands of years, now available in digital form for analysis at scale. Uh, and I can already point to you know, some specific examples where I can say that's something I can prove or that I couldn't do before. Uh, and I can conceptualize, A, the way I can deal with data at scale, and B, the way I can work with languages, source text in languages that I had not studied. That would have been impossible 20 years ago. Now this, I look at this, and Germany is actually has invested a lot in digitization in the narrow sense. They've got a lot of scanned books. You have wonderful metadata, and my colleagues are preparing in the DFG to support improving the way they can extract data from these scan books. My colleagues look at them and say, we don't know what, OCR, what optical character recognition is. We don't know what scan books are. We don't know what text mining is, and it's not our problem. Uh, and thus, your experts, are, who are, have a very tr strong skills in a traditional sense, uh, may make it impossible for Germany to establish itself in a revolutionary position in the study of the humanities. And so you have instrument questions of who assesses what and how you assess. You have real challenges here in assessing innovative work, maybe because you're dominated by an oligarchy of professor doctors who are my age. Seriously, it's a big problem. Yeah, so Professor Kaufmann is, uh, Dr. Kaufmann is right it's by saying it really depends on the individual. As it depended in the past, it will in the future. Are the individual researchers open and are they ready to use the methods? Uh, I, I think openness can speed up the scientific processes. Um, uh, for example, in, in economics, there is a very extensive open access publication culture. And why is that? Because it takes so long to publish the paper in the journal. So what the scientists do, they take the publication and put it on an institutional open access repository. Um, in Germany, it's uh, ZBW, my institution, providing that, and uh, we uh, sh push that publication to an international repository, REPEC, Research Papers in Economics. So there are all the open access publications, and at the same time, the authors submit this particular paper to a uh, publisher, and two years later, it uh, appears in a journal, and then they, it, it can be formally you know, cited. But the actual result has been published two years ago. So, um, that is number one, so uh, increased uh, speed um, uh, to access the data. And also, if it's open access, the visibility of a particular pu um, publication can increase. We investigated what happens with our publications in our open access repository, and it revealed that these papers appear in a scientific blog, or cited on Twitter, cited in Wikipedia, so not only the accessibility of the paper increased, also the visibility, many, many channels in which these publications become visible. All right, thank you. Last question. Thank you. Holger Gerhardt from the Max Delbrück Center and the Berlin Institute of Health. Um, there's one thing I'm missing here, and that is, do you have an idea what the value is, what the value we could use to actually judge decisions as you in the politics or in the different areas go forward. When we, when we heard about all the, these things, I see there's, it's not clear whether these open access ideas, open data, openness, using blogs, using all these uh, social media tools, will it increase diversity of ideas? Will it enlarge the idea pool? Or will it lead to blatant trending effects where we follow 
some ideas that manage to create leadership, but we lose diversity okay. in the scientific community. And I think if I was to give a comment to the politician, I would be very careful taking any decision that reduces diversity, that has short-term impact, that will just streamline programmatic funding. All of these aspects are difficult because we have very little... Can, can we actually predict where things will really happen? Mm -hmm. So my question to the people who look Elsevier, for example, would be, can you use your data mining approach to help humanity predict where the next breakthrough will actually mm -hmm. happen? Because so we have no idea. It's about the diversity of ideas, and in a way it's, a, it's another important version of the same question before, the question of the effect of Science 2.0. Is it a positive effect in terms of diversifying, of pushing new ideas, uh, or is it some kind of negative effect of mainstreaming, so that, that some kind of pressure, social pressure will come up? And I think we should use that as the final question of the round, uh, of the panel, and we, we'll just go around the panel. I want to know that from all of you, is, is Science 2.0 something that will lead us to more mainstream, to more social pressure, to more, yeah, maybe to less innovation, or is it, is it uh, a tendency that will give us more diversified ideas, will lead us to ideas that we can't think of now? So is it something that actually will bring up completely new ideas, which wouldn't we have with Science 1.0? Uh, maybe you start, and then we just go around the panel. I mean, uh, Your first, final words. Yeah. Um, I think that, um, uh, that the risk of having a, having a bias uh, was already always there because uh, impact uh, or uh, um, image of a journal is also kind of a bias. But you are completely right. Um, we have now more you know, um, possibilities to measure uh, the impact of a paper, like for example, how often has a, it retweeted on Twitter or how often has it been, I don't know what. And through that, there is the high risk to get a bias into uh, like the bibliographic ranking, resulting indeed in a situation in which you might oversee important papers which have not been, you know, commented, cited, liked in the social media channels. And the key problem there is at the moment we don't have good ranking mechanisms for bibliographic data. Bibliographic data is just a catalog data like title, author, name, publication year. Um, these days you only have two indicators uh, um, determining how a paper is ranked. The first one is time, like the more recent, the higher in the ranking. And the second one is um, uh, like maybe impact of the journal or name of the author. Um, currently the German Research Foundation is funding a project to investigate on uh, like new ranking mechanisms for bibliographic data. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Professor Crane, more diversity, less diversity? Well, I don't think we could have any less diversity than in the cult academic cultures with which I had experience in print culture, uh, where you had very narrow channels of exchange dominated uh, with capital, it was, very, it was very expensive and hard to get your stuff into the conversation. Uh, maybe we can have experiments and find there are fewer ideas. I'm a, I don't think the problem is that we have fewer ideas. The problem is we have crazy ideas as well as good ideas. Now, my, you know, I'm, a, I'm an Alexander von Humboldt professor. They gave me a lot of support, research support for five years. And my number one job is to make sure that we have as much of the fundamental textual data, the classical Greek and Latin texts, in a machine actionable CC license format as possible. Why is that important? Well, first, for transparency of science, uh, so that if I make a, a statement, the basis for the textual basis for my proposition is available for, for public inspection. But B, that's the only control I know to advance for better ideas to evolve past bad ideas, is to get the data the evidence out there for discourse and debate. The only an, an American Supreme Court justice said the only answer for hate, hateful speech is more speech. And the only answer for bad ideas or ill-founded ideas is more ideas, more discourse, with more recourse to the basis upon which those ideas are based. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kaufman. I uh, 
uh, my hope and my expectation is that it will lead to more diversity. So this is uh, Science 2.0. It's a global project. Uh, the world is diverse. So uh, it is my big hope that it will lead to more diversity. It's a bad one. Uh, is Sasha Frischke here today? He was on the attendance list because he wrote a great book, actually, where actu actually I'm hoping, if he's right, that we're going towards more diversity. He describes five schools of open science. So already with Science 2.0, that I call open science, you are talking about a, a diversity, a pragmatic school, an infrastructure school, democratic school, public school, measurement school. So people are coming at it, and you can see that also from very diverse way. So I'm hoping for more diversity. Now, addressing the, your question about how to evaluate that, again, I think we are in a time of big data. And you need to use all the big data out there. We cannot go from impact factor to just how much traffic there is on Twitter. You need to be able to link all that. I think today what we do when we do research evaluation is take a snapshot of what the situation is with the impact factor, with the L metrics, etc. What we need to develop is a way to assess that in a dy dynamic way. Not to take a snapshot at one point, but to see how things are evolving. And for that, yes, we're developing tools. We have a collaboration right now with, with the European Commission and CERN to be able to look at trends, to find what those trends are. They, the policymakers want to know what the big next question are going to be. CERN want to know what the next big technology will be for them. And we want to know as publishers what to publish next but more importantly, also offer that as a service for the uh, world uh, of research. Thank you very much. So what we found out right here in the end is that we are still at the state, in the stage of promises and hopes. We don't really know yet where this thing takes us, where Science 2.0 will take us. It's good to hope for things. It's even better to to find out ways how to make sure that those things happen. That's why we talk so much about evaluation tonight, I guess. Um, and I think it's good that we had the chance to be very concrete on the issue. I don't like debates where everybody just says, oh, it's so, such a great development and everything will be great. And I think that we were kind of optimistic tonight, but not too optimistic. We were also some kind of cautious about certain things. So I think it was a very good debate. Thank you very much. To my panelists, thank you very much in the audience.